Good morning, good morning, good morning. We are happy to be here. Another beautiful Sunday morning God has blessed us to see. We are alive and well, and we know that it is because of God's mercies that we are not consumed. So we appreciate God for blessing us to be alive today and to be uh, healthy, to have peace of mind. Not a peace of our minds, but we have peace of mind, and that we should not take for granted. We have a great lesson before us this morning, and we are just excited to study with you. We hope you are excited as well. So, Pastor. <clears throat> All right. Good morning to everyone. We thank God for his goodness, and we thank God for his blessings. Amen. Let's get ready to pray, and then we'll proceed with our lesson for today. Dear God in heaven, again, we thank you, and we praise you. We worship you. We give your name the glory and the honor. God, you're so good. You are so wonderful. Yes, you watched over us last night while we slept in our beds. Yes, you allowed us to get up this morning to see this beautiful Sunday morning. Yes. We thank you, God. We thank, thank you, God. you for your many blessings. We thank you for your provision. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, for your protection. Yes, Lord. Without you, Lord, we would not be here this morning. Yes, so, God, we are grateful unto you. I pray, God, that you will bless. I yes, pray, God, Lord. that you will lead. Yes. That you will direct our paths. God, we need your presence in this room in a mighty way. Yes, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Well, Lord, there will be those who will come who will be in need of healing. Oh, God. Need of a touch. Yes, God. Need of salvation. Yes, Lord. In need of a miracle. And, oh, God, this is the best place to be. This is the best place to be on this Sunday morning. Yes, God. I pray, God, that there is a move in this house. Yes, Lord. Pray, God, that you will touch the minds and hearts of the people in the name of, the Jesus. Name of Jesus let the sick be healed yes God. let those oh God who are seeking you find you God yes God. in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus God we love you God we praise you yes God for you deserve the praises you yes, deserve Lord. the glory the glory belongs to you yes Lord. in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus God we pray today we pray we pray God for this situation that is in you praying yes God but the people are suffering now, God. Oh, God. People are wondering what to do, where to go. God, I pray that you bring peace in that place. In the name of Jesus, turn those Russian troops back home, God. Let them go home, God. In the name of Jesus. Oh, God, have mercy on the people there. Yes, Have God. mercy yes, on them, God. Oh God. Yes, God. In the name, in the of, name Jesus. of Jesus. We need you now, God. We need you, Jesus. We need you in these yes, God. dark times, dark days oh, our world is experiencing. Yes, God. Lord, somebody is yet calling on your name. Yes, Lord. We have not all turned our backs on yes, you. Yes, God. God, we're calling on you. Yes, Lord. To come to our rescue. We're yes, calling God. on you, God, to help us help, Lord. in these dire needs. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We love you, God, and we, we honor you. We praise you now. Yes, God. Lord, lead and direct us in this time that we're studying your word in Sunday school. I pray, God, that we will gain a greater knowledge of who yes. you are, your will, and your way. Yes. We thank you. Thank you, God. And we praise you right now in yes, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. All right, our lesson this morning is Fruits of Redemption. Our subject, Fruits of Redemption. You do not have a book. We are coming from Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through chapter 6, verse 10. All right, our lesson aim. By the end of the lesson, we will hear Paul's teaching on faithfulness and sharing others' burdens. Feel compassion and a sense of duty to others and support one another in the faith, excuse me, through service. I like me for today's lesson that students will demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. Yes. We are to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. All right, Bible learning to understand that we are responsible for our own walk with the Lord. Listen, I don't care how many times. You see on Facebook, I saw one this morning, people explaining why they no longer go to church. One lady says something happened. Listen, the scripture says we are responsible for our own walk with the Lord. The church is bigger than any one person. The church is bigger than any one incident. 
God has designed the church for our spiritual growth. And I don't know about you, when I am not here, I feel the effects of it. So listen, we're responsible for our own walk with the Lord. Bible application to learn how to access the fruit of the Spirit, and then students' responses. Students will do good to everyone, especially to fellow believers. All right, we're going to turn it over now for the pastor so he can give us some um, some um, background. background information. Uh, I want to say this, that this uh, is a continuation of lessons that we've been studying uh, in the book of Galatians. Paul is yet dealing with the fact uh, the difference between the law, the law of Moses, and that is living under grace. Yes. And so uh, the people uh, the, the, in the, the church of Galatia, uh, they were basically Gentiles, non-Jewish people, but a group of Judaizers. Judaizers were those individuals who who uh, said that in order to please God, if you're going to go to heaven, you have got to live by the law of Moses. So they wanted to bring back all of the things that uh, they had been instructed under the law, uh, and they wanted to bind that upon the Gentiles. And of course, Paul was uh, letting them know that this was not the case. I want to say this, we have to be very careful in today's time. Uh, you actually have some people today that are trying to mix the law with grace. You have some, and, 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 and I don't want to get too critical because I, I need to study this group a little bit more, but you have, uh, I'm a little leery about those, some, some of those people that refer to themselves as the Messianic Jews. Uh, they're saying that we're Jews, we're for Jesus. Mm -hmm. That we are Christians, but you know our blood is uh, Jewish. But in some of their teachings, they go to a lot of the things of the law, trying to explain some things. And I know you do use the law to explain some things on the New Covenant, but I'm a little leery of them because sometimes some of the things that they're teaching uh, will cause a person to revert back under the law. And if you go back under the law subscribe to that, then what you're really doing, you're trying to justify yourself through works and not through grace. You cannot be saved through works. It is through the grace of God. It's unmerited favor. It is through the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross. And so you have to be very mindful of that. I was looking at this section uh, light on the, the word and I think that it has some important fact. Let me read some of it. Uh, that's on page 98 for some of our books. It said the Apostle Paul challenged the believers of his day to learn what every believer today would do and remember. The key to making progress in the realm of Christian freedom is to keep walking in the spirit. And he goes on to say, Paul was very much aware of the Galatian need for a power, listen to this, that the law could not give. Look, look what he said. Uh, need for a power that the law could not give. The law only explained what was right, what was wrong, and the penalty for breaking the law was death. But it gave you no power yes. to help you to abide in righteousness. The history of the Jewish people consistently revealed that there are some things the law cannot do. Rules and regulations can command, but they cannot empower one to do what is commanded. Rules and regulations serve as a guide or a roadmap, but they cannot motivate and enable one to follow the direction that God has given. Uh, people here in Little Valley have often heard me say, especially when I work in the altar, one, uh, when I uh, make an altar call, is that we are not, the church is not designed to be a set of rules, do's and don'ts, okay? And, and here's the problem. Many people who the Spirit of God have touched their hearts and they want to do what is right, they want to be saved, but they want to please God, they feel like a lot of times, I, I, I can't go to church or join church until I straighten up 
my life first. And what they're doing, they're looking at, they're really looking at some rules and regulations as such. Now, the Bible does teach us what sin is mm -hmm. and things that we ought to avoid. But you really cannot avoid those things and stop doing those things until you come to Jesus. When Jesus comes into your heart, when you, when you just simply repent of your sins, surrender to the Lord, then guess what he does? Through his grace, he, uh, he's, he allows or he sends the Holy Ghost to abide and to live within you. And when I speak of him sending the Holy Ghost at this point, I'm not talking about the baptism with the evidence of speaking the tongue. I'm speaking of regeneration. A person gets saved. The Spirit of God comes into your soul right then. He cleanses your soul. Then he abides in you that you, can, that you can continue to live a life that pleases God. So, you see, when you get saved, it's not a matter of just so just keeping rules and regulations, do's and don'ts. But I love him so until I want to do everything I can to please him. The Spirit of God lives within you. But, but here again, uh, many people initially coming to the Lord. And even some people who have been saved for a while. Mm -hmm. If you're not careful, you can fall back into the law. And I want you to understand that when I say law, it, it, it's kind of a broad thing. It's not just the law of Moses, although that's what Paul is dealing with right there. Mm -hmm. But you can make practically anything a law to yourself. Anything that you uh, that you observe and you're trying to keep without allowing Jesus to lead your life becomes a law to you. So you can make a whole lot of things laws. You can make fasting. A law. Okay. Should we fast? Yes. The Bible teaches us to do so. But remember Jesus condemned the Pharisees. The Pharisees were known for what? Their prayers. They were known for fasting. You knew when they were fasting because they had a sad countenance. And, and Jesus said, when well, you fast, you ought to put some oil on your face. You ought to comb your hair. <laughs> he didn't use those exact words, but that's what he meant though. And, and, and he was condemning them because of what they were doing. It was a show. And in essence, they would deceive themselves, thinking, hey, this is what's going to get me into heaven one day. But, but just fasting and not knowing the purpose of fasting and why you should be fasting and the, the proper way or the proper thing is not going to cause you to, to be saved. All right. All right. So let's, that was really, 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 really good information. I hope we're listening and taking notes. Listen, it's Sunday school time. We ought to have paper and pencil. There's no way can, we can remember these things, but a good student, as we teach them in our, in our school rooms, in our classrooms, we tell them, look, you need to take notes because it's good. Today we got a great lesson. All right? It's all right to take notes. If y'all saw my study Bible up here, I got notes everywhere. I just write all in my Bible. I see something that's interesting. I just underline I go to write. All right. So I first outlined the spirit produces fruit. That comes from Galatians 5, 22 through 26. And it reads, But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So here, um, Paul is talking to the people at Galatia about the fruit of the spirit. Now, we, we've, we've uh, had many lessons about the fruit of the spirit we talked about the fruit of the spirit we've had programs about the fruit of the spirit we talk about the singularity of the word fruit rather than fruits i like what the author said here instead of looking at these as different and separate fruits we can look at them as a cluster one fruit that has a cluster so i i like that uh that uh exact 
explanation. That's the word that I'm looking for. But let's let's uh, delve into this. Now, let me let let's first say this. We're talking about the fruit of the spirit. So, in order to have the fruit of the spirit, you must have God's spirit on the inside. And that's what God wants to do. He wants to come and live on the inside of every believer. And so when we avail ourselves, as Pastor talked to us about when the Lord saves us, we, there's this work of regeneration that the Spirit begins in us, and the Spirit dwells in us. Well, these fruit are the byproduct. They are the result of the Spirit living on the inside. So this is how you know people belong to God. They exemplify the fruit. They have love. They have joy. They have peace. They are long-suffering. They are gentle. They are good. They have faith. They are meek. They are temperate. So they have self-control. Look, saved people don't just lose control and do all kinds of ungodly things or say all kinds of ungodly things. Saved people exemplify the fruit of the Spirit. And that's how you know that the Spirit of God lives in us. If you want to know, you know, we're talking about, look, verse 25 says, if you live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Listen, we must realize that this is a daily walk. And it's all about our choices every day. The flesh is ever present. The flesh does not go anywhere. But we must crucify the flesh daily. And so, yes, the flesh will always be there to tell you how to react to a situation to tell you what to say to that person who just told you off. But you have to make a conscious decision that I will not walk after the flesh. I do not obey the works of the flesh. Oh, it feels good when you tell people off. Oh, you know how you, you, you even tell your girl, I, I'm gonna tell you something, I told her something. Let me tell you what I told her. Nothing but the flesh. But when you abide by the spirit, when you walk in the spirit and mind the things of the spirit, that is when you can uh, look good in the eyes of God. So do you want to look good in the eyes of man or do you want to look good in the eyes of God? Now I'm not saying that you can never speak up for yourself. I can remember a time when I lived in Jackson and I worked at Sears and I remember the boss uh, got so angry that he just came over there and cussed everybody out. This was his first time ever doing that. And he just came over there and started talking to us and just was using profanity. I don't know what had happened to him that day. And so I said nothing in front of the people. But as I sat there, I know it was nobody but the Spirit of the Lord who began to deal with me. And because sometimes, listen, sometimes we need to be silent. The Spirit of the Lord would tell us to be silent, but sometimes the Spirit of the Lord would tell us to speak up when nobody else will. And so I went to his office and I knocked on the door and very politely told him, I said, you know what? I have always respected you. I said, but what you just did to us, that was the ultimate disrespect. I have never used profanity with you. And I would really appreciate it if you didn't use it with me. Now I know, I, now listen, I was a college student. I was a sophomore in college. And this was a fully grown man who was my boss. So I know it was nobody but God who led me to speak up for everybody else who wouldn't speak up. You know what that man said to me that day? He said, I'm so sorry. He said, I never should have done that. He said, I've been having a bad day. And he said, you know what? I'm a Sunday school teacher. I had no business reacting in that way. And so sometimes on our jobs, we, we, we can, you know, be quiet. But some, whenever we respond, we need to follow the spirit of God is what I'm saying. We need to show people that love that we have. Now, what about the other part of it? If you read the verses that come before that, he shows us the works of the spirit. Though, I mean, the works of the flesh. These are the things that we know. How do we know that we're walking in the spirit and not in the flesh? Well, he gives us the works of the flesh. What verse does that start in? Uh, go on up. Oh, here it is. Uh, verse yeah. 17. Let me go to the King James. Uh, verse 17, and it says, For the flesh lusteth after the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if ye be led by the spirit of the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, verse 19, are manifest, 
which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, drunkenness, reveling, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So we must walk after the spirit. We have the, those things that manifest that tell us when you're walking in the flesh. And the fruit of the spirit tell us when we are walking in the spirit. Sister Alicia Knight and Jones said the fruit of the spirit is our DNA test that determines he's our father. Oh, I like that. Just as we share our natural parents' DNA, so it is the spirit. So it is in the spirit. So who's out? Who's our father, the devil or God? Check your fruit to determine who you belong to. Oh, you got a word this morning, Sister Knight and Jones. All right, that last part of that scripture say, let us not be desirous of vain glory. Listen, it is not about you. It's not about me showing who I am and what I can do uh, uh, and envying one another and having strife with one another, competing with one another. Listen, in the kingdom of God, there is no competition. I don't have to outdo anybody. You just be who God made you to be. Exemplify those gifts and talents that God has given you. And you operate in the ministry that God has given you. There is no competition. There is no envying, and there should be no strife. Not if you're walking after the spirit. All right, Pastor. Well. I think you covered it real good before I make comments. Let me hear from the audience and you that on Zoom. Let me hear from you all. I thought about it when I read Speak, it. stand up, and I you take your mic, you take your uh, mask down a little bit. Uh, I thought about when I was reading the fruit of the spirit, I thought about Daniel when uh, they said he had a, a spirit of excellence. Can we consider that the fruit of the spirit, he had the fruit of, uh, they could be considered the fruit of excellence that he had, could we, because uh, during that time, he showed every one of these, did he not? Well, I, I think you, I, that might lead to another debate okay. as such, and, and I don't want to get anybody confused, but I think you can uh, say that he had the fruit of the Spirit. The reason I say that, we, you, you're going back to an Old Testament character who was living during the time of the law. However, we explained a few Sundays ago that uh, even living under the law, uh, you were yet uh, to have faith in God mm -hmm. because without that faith, the law still was not going to do you any good because remember the law said when you, when you transgress the law, the penalty was death. So if a person did wrong back in Daniel's time, uh, they were to do what? Offer a bullock, goat, or a lamb for their sins. Now, just killing that poor, poor animal, or poor animal, and, and, and killing that animal as such, <laughs> it, just doing it, just be doing it, didn't really uh, do you any good. Yeah. You had to have faith yeah. that God would accept the blood of that animal, which typified or sim symbolized the blood of Jesus, yeah. if you follow what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So not just just abiding by the law was going to do you any good uh, in that essence too. So to sum it up, and, and, and I hope I'm not getting about confused here, but in the Old Testament days, the Spirit of God yet dwelled with man, but he could not dwell in his completeness. Mm -hmm. You see, today we can be endowed, we can have the Spirit of God to live within us on a permanent basis. But the best way to explain the, the Old Testament saints, they were saved, they were righteous up to the point that they could be in that day. Mm -hmm. But the Spirit of God could not dwell there permanently. It was on a temporary basis until Jesus would come and down the cross. So I hope I gave you an answer to that question. Okay, another question or comment? Anybody else want to? Uh, I think Sister Riley has covered this section uh, very well. Amen. The point is that 
uh, we are to walk, and the scripture does know, to walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. Yeah. Now, what is the flesh? It's not talking about your skin. Yes. But it's referred to that Adamic nature, that part of you that's unregenerate, or that part of you that cannot be regenerated. There's a part of you. You remember when Jesus said that flesh and blood should not inherit the kingdom of God? He said flesh and blood. But you know, when he came back after the resurrection, his resurrection, and the disciples would think that he was a spirit one time. He said, now a spirit or a ghost does not have flesh and bones. So let's explain what he's talking about here. Flesh and blood should not inherit the kingdom of God. When we are, listen to this, when, when the, the day of the rapture takes place, the saints who have died, Paul lets know they're going to what? Come up out the grave. Mm -hmm. Those of us that remain of, who are alive are going to be changed in the twinkle of an eye. That body that comes up out the grave or the body that the saints who are alive that's going to be changed, that's going to be a new body, y'all. It is not the same body yes. that's going to go in the grave. Mm -hmm. Okay? You know, the, the, some people teach against uh, uh, cremation. Thank you. Teach against cremation. There's nothing in the Bible that teaches against cremation. Why? Because that body that is burnt up, you won't need that body no way. The body's in the grave. You, you, don't, you won't need that body. You're going to get a new body. You see, when a, when a saved person dies, so what's coming after a brand new body, a glorified body, a glorified body oh, which is real, it is material, all right? It is definitely material, but it's not the same body that we have presently because it has been marked really in one sense forever by sin. Yeah. Because I want you to look at something. Even though we are saved individuals, we yet have to deal with our flesh. Mm -hmm. That sin nature, it is still there, but it does not dominate your life. It, you, you have died in one sense, but uh, Satan is always going to work to Make it rise again. Your flesh will rise again if you don't keep control. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 6, let not sin reign in your mortal bodies. You look at the original translation, it really said, let not the sin. So if it's, about, if it's saying really let not the sin, it's not talking about a sin in particular, but it's talking sin about the nature. sin nature. Don't let the sin nature reign over your mortal body. The only way that you... Uh, can prevent the sin nature from reigning over your mortal body is to have the spirit of Christ, which is the spirit of God, living on the inside. So therefore, in the day of the rapture, we get a what? We get a brand new body, actually. Now, you see, can I explain it this way? And I'm kind of, it ties in less, but it's kind of going off a little bit at the same time. But see, when, when, when a saint died, and you, you immediately go to heaven. What goes to heaven? The inner man, the spirit and the soul, which lives in this fleshly body. Your eyes are nothing but a window for the real person to what? Okay. To look out. The reason you have to have a, 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 a physical body here on earth is in, in, in order to operate in a material world. Yes. That's why at death, the spirit man, which is the spirit and soul, has to leave this world. If you're saved, you go on to be with the Lord in heaven. Those that are not saved will go into hell. Here's the thing. On the day of the resurrection, which is the day of the rapture, what's actually going to occur is the, the spirit man that's in heaven is going to come back with Christ. All right? To, re to receive those people who are yet alive. That's one of the reasons. But at the same time, when we talk about coming up out the grave, that old body that went in the grave is not coming out. It's a new body that's going to come out. And that new body again is real. The, the spirit that comes from heaven is going to what? Inhabit the new body, which is totally different than the body you have right now. So Jesus, when he came, he had flesh and bone. Mm -hmm. So will our bones? You have bones in the new body. So that's what that comes out of the grave. 
Well, the bones won't come out of the grave, but, but you're going to be, uh, I'm trying to think of the scripture that talks about us, be, about Christ being the first fruit. The first fruit. Of them that slept. Of them that slept. Mm -hmm. So he's the first one to receive that kind of a body, right. which was flesh and what? Bones. Bone. So that means the disciples could touch him. They could see him. They could talk to him. That body, Jesus ate with him. We go to heaven, we, we still going to be eating. Won't have to eat to continue to live, but it would be more of a pleasure. So it is a real body because in order to operate here on earth and even to enjoy the material things of heaven, because heaven is a real place. It is a place with material. In order to fully enjoy, you're going to need a body. Yes, ma'am. All right. All right. Yes. Yes, eventually, yes, yes. But, and, and she's going kind of deep because we've been dealing with the end time discussion. By the way, since you brought that up, Superintendent Riley will be with us on Wednesday night, 5.30 for part two. But you, you're exactly right. That, that new body will reign with Christ. All right? The Bible talks about it being kings and priests, joint heirs with Christ, ruling with him. That will happen during the millennial kingdom because there's actually going to be two classes of people here. The saints in their glorified body, this new body that I'm talking about. But what a lot of people don't understand is that the human race is going to continue all through the, the days of the tribulation, seven years of tribulation. And then when the millennial kingdom start, you yet going to have people Let's refer to them as natural people, that is, flesh and blood like we are. They will be in the Millennium Kingdom too. I don't have time to go into all the explanation. Y'all need to come on Wednesday night. Maybe we can't get into it. Okay. Thank you. But, but that's a good question. So, as, so what I'm saying is this, is that we, even as believers, it's not you come to church, shake the preacher's hand, put your name on the church roll, that's it. You have to continue to have this relationship with God that you have what? That you can have control over the flesh so that you can walk after the spirit. That spirit is capitalized. Spirit is talking about the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. I can walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. Yes. Because if I walk after the flesh, then those things, this is rather red. In Galatians, what was that? The, the same chapter, chapter six, book starts with verse 19. 19. If you don't walk out the spirit, then you're going to mind the things of the flesh. You're going to walk out the flesh. And therefore, adultery will come in. Fornication, where you might say, well, everybody's not an adulterer. That's true. But but keep looking at that list. Lasciviousness. What is that? Anything that lens or that, that that goes in the direction of sexual produces, desire. Produces, uh -huh. or, yeah, produces sexual desire. So that's where our teaching comes about we need to uh, wear the right type of clothing that you don't cause the person to what? To be tempted or to fall into lust or to fornication as such. And so many other things we can talk about in that list that if you don't walk out the spirit, you're going to walk after the flesh. All right. All right, Sister um, Hope Williams said, um, this is absolutely amazing because so many people teach against cremation. Thank you, Pastor, for fi uh, freeing us from the condemnation of the teaching. All right, uh, Brother Ahmad, that is coming from Galatians chapter 5, verses, and it begins at verses 19. I think, uh, I don't know which list you're talking about, but if you start with verse 19, It'll give you the work, a list with the works of the flesh. And if you come on down you will, to verses 22, you will have the list of the fruit of the Spirit, 22 through 26. So if you go to Galatians chapter 5, you will see, um, you will see the, 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 the list of both. All right? 
The next outline, help and loving humility. That's coming from Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, and it reads, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man thinketh him, think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. So here Paul begins to talk to us about how we should respond in our, commu our faith community. And particularly if a brother falls from grace, if a brother does something that is not according to the word of God, he tells us, first of all, those of us who are spiritual, those of us who are saved, we should restore. Our, our, our goal is restoration. Yeah. To talk to this brother or sister in such a way to uh, address this brother or sister in, in love. Because our goal is restoration. Now, I, I've heard people talk about, uh, you know, you, you got to rebuke and you got to do all of this. Listen. The Spirit tells us to go to these people in a spirit of meekness, considering yourselves. Don't think that you are so great that you can never fall, that you can never displease God. So he tells us that, that we should approach that brother who has fallen. We've got to approach him in the, wrong, in the right way because if we approach him in the wrong way, the Scripture said a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. So we must make sure, first of all, we must make sure that we approach the person in, the, in a spirit of love, in a spirit of meekness, considering yourselves, how would you want somebody to approach you if you had fallen? And so when I consider those things, I know I'm going to approach the person in the right way. So he goes on to say, he's, he tells us to bear one another's burdens. Listen, we are living and feeling the effects of a pandemic. Yes. And we will be feeling these effects for years to come. I don't know if we really realize that. We don't even know all of the ramifications of this, is this uh, pandemic, both educationally, spiritually, because we know that we have, people have fallen by the wayside, uh, financially. I mean, there are so many things. And listen, some people are struggling emotionally. Yeah. They're struggling mentally. They have come to the conclusion, I don't want to live anymore. Right. Life is too cruel. So the Bible tells us to bear one another's burdens. Yes. Reach out to your brother or sister. Try to talk. Are you okay? Do you need anything, especially when you see that person is struggling? Because the scripture says, if you think, uh, it goes on to say, uh, let it, if you think that you are something when you are nothing, you deceive yourself. Amen. So if you think that you're more than what you ought to, you think that, oh, I'll never fall. Now, don't get me wrong. The scripture say now to him who is able to keep me from falling. Yeah. And to present me faultless before the presence of his glory. The, 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 the spirit of God, Jesus is able to keep us from falling. But don't you think you can do anything in and of yourself? Amen. You know, you, you see some people and they act like they've got it all together and you better not even cross their line. Because if you do, you know, they are, it's just the attitude that some people uh, have. Amen. But we must be approachable, saints. We must be approachable. We must be the types of people that people feel like I can come to when something is wrong. I can text uh, Brother Archie. I can text Sister Mary. I can text Sister Henry and just say, listen, pray for me. Amen. And when I, if somebody texts you and say, pray for you, don't start speculating as to what's going on. Just pray for them. Amen. If they had wanted to tell you what was going on, they would have told you. Amen. But listen. We need to make sure that we have the right attitude so that we are approachable. Now, if you... Oh, okay. Did you, did you want to say something a minute ago? I was going to say that, you know, that's 
when we talk about how we approach people and how we handle people, whether it's your family members, co-workers, or just people in general, your prayer life is what guides you and how you handle people. If you don't have a strong prayer life, and if you're not constantly seeking God and asking God to deal with you, to make you, to, to allow Christ to live within you, then you can't be that person that can show someone the love of Christ. Absolutely. I might not have got it out the way I was trying to. We got you. You ready for me? Yes. I was just going to say this. I was looking at what you were saying about the pandemic and the effects of the pandemic. Uh, this is why, as pastor, uh, I one of the reasons I, I, I made a, a conscious decision some time ago to reopen the church. Now, when the pandemic first hit, and we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know nothing about this virus. What was happening? I, I told the church, I think that that first month, that that was the correct thing to do because we had to learn, like today we're wearing a mask, we social distance and so forth because we, we believe God is going to bring us out of this day. Amen. But I think the advice of us social distancing and, and, and doing some other things has helped us tremendously. But here's the point. There, there, there are some people, and this is not to indict anybody, but there's some who uh, took a while for them to reopen. And, and, and those persons felt left out because during the pandemic, we heard bad news day after day, week after week. Don't think that that doesn't bother you because back in that those first few months, it was bothering me. I lost a lot of brothers in the gospel, preachers that I had known for many, many years. And, and, and that was hard to go through. I got to the point, I didn't even want to answer the phone, particularly if it was late at night or early in the morning. Who's, I'm sorry, I'm wondering who's next? Who's passed on next? And what I'm simply saying is that a community of church people, this community, it means something to me. It means something to me to see y'all in church, to be around you all, for us to what? To pray together to have worship together, to, uh, to be um, in, in a time of singing, to hear testimonies and so forth. I was thinking the other day, look, uh, we really hadn't had just what you call testimony service in a while. So we're going to do something about that. Uh, we, I'm, on, I'm, I'm working on something. We're going to do something about that as well. We, but we've heard testimonies. We've opened back up on Wednesday night for prayer. Because let me tell you something. We can pray virtually, you know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to indict anybody that's, that's in virtual church right now. We can pray virtually, but there's nothing like being in the house of God and praying together. It's a total difference. And, you know, we're going to start our prayer revival this evening at 530. I'm encouraging the saints to come as many that will come. Come, there's a blessing in this prayer revival just for you. Amen. There is a blessing for you. And what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, when we were in our homes, closed up in our homes and not able to see each other, don't you know that that did something to our minds, our emotional being, to be closed up and not being able to get out? God did not make us to be creatures that would be alone. To be shut up somewhere. He made us to have fellowship. Fellowship with him. But to have fellowship with one another. Mm -hmm. And so it was important. For the church to open back up. For even our mental well-being. Our emotional well-being. Many times I have. Even in the services. I find myself rebuking. The spirit of depression. Rebuking spirit of grief, rebuking even a spirit of suicide because it has grown. Those spirits are rampant in the land right now. And so I, I wanted to just point that out. All of that, even when we go to what this part of the lesson, let me give it back to you because our time is running out. But when we look at what Paul said, if a person be overtaken in the fall, in other words, listen, the spirit of God, 
understood and knew that in, in, in the future that there would be persons who would do wrong, who would fall from grace. But Paul is showing us how to what? How to treat those individuals. Yes. You go to, you go to them with, with the spirit of meekness. You don't go there, I, you know, I'm coming to show you, I got you. Mm -hmm. We ought to have a ministry of reconciliation. That's right. Amen. We are to help one another. Yeah. And so, and Paul said, now don't you get conceited. Don't you get all lifted up thinking that it cannot happen to you. You know, because it could. If you're not careful, if you don't do the thing that you need to do, you could fall in that same type of trap. Amen. And so we have to understand that and be willing to do what? To help one another, pray for one another, give kind words, give encouraging words where you can. Now, the church has not always understood this. Uh, the church at times has been, you know, extremely hard on people. You know that that maybe have done wrong and so forth, and 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 we we talk about some of those things that the church did. I think it was a misunderstanding, not knowing the scripture. Then some people were just wrong, and I, again, I'm not trying to indict people, but I I believe that when you learn better, you ought to do better. Right. And I made the statement once to you all here at Little the Valley that the church is not designed to put folks out. It's, that's not that's not the purpose of the church to to. Just ex excommunicate people. Now, there might be some instances where a person becomes rebellious against the teachings of the church, against the teachings of the Bible, and bring open shame to the church, and that person refuses to what to acknowledge, to repent, and to get themselves together, or at least try to get themselves together. A person that's rebellious, well, you might have to take some actions in that situation. But listen, we ought to love one another, bear one another's burden, as Paul said, and try to help each other. All right, before we move on, our time is out, but before we move on, we need to look at verse 5 because yes. as the uh, author said, that verse 2 and verse 5, if you're not careful, people will say that they contradict one another. Okay. Um, bear you one another's burden, of course. He asks us to help one another. And then in verse 5, he says, for every man shall bear his own burden. In other words, everybody needs to assume personal responsibility as yes. well. Right. We have to definitely work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. All right. Our last outline, believers are to preserve, persevere in doing good. And it reads, let him that is taught in the word communicate with him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of his flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to his spirit, to the spirit, shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them, excuse me, who are of the household of faith. So here Paul begins to use the metaphor of a farmer. And he begins to let us know that, listen, it is right to give to your spiritual leader, your, the person who is teaching you the word of God, the way of God. See, a lot of people want to hear uh, all kinds of things, but when it comes to giving to the man of God, they rebel against that. Now, they are give to uh, the, the sports people. They have made Michael Jordan and all of the sports people and arenas, they have made these people multimillionaires. Amen. Billionaires, some of them. Billionaires. But because the preacher, such as I'll just say T.D. Jakes, because he has a lot of money, they want to come for him. Now, he has books, he has all kinds of other things, but they don't look at that. They only want to come for the preacher. I have never heard anybody say anything about the money that Michael, Michael Jackson had that uh, Kanye West has, he has billions of dollars, Kim Kardashian, the, all of these people, nobody is bothered by the money that they have amassed, and they have amassed this money because people have listened to them, people have uh, watched them on TV, people have bought their, their things, but when it comes to uh, sowing in the ministry, people have a problem with that, and that is because our thought process in this world has become contaminated by sin. And so Paul begins to set this record straight. 
He said, if you, you, you that are taught in the word or who, who is taught in the word should communicate to him that teacher. Listen, if a person is teaching you, you ought to be re uh, uh, ready to communicate with him. You ought to be ready to give to him to, or to her. And he goes on to say, don't be fooled. God is not mocked. He's not, uh, he's not scornfully disrespected. Because whatever a man sows, that shall he weep. When the farmer goes out there and sows seed, he expects a crop in return. And so it's the same thing with God. When you take care of God's business, I always say, God will take care of your business. I'm not going to debate with anybody as to whether I should pay my tithe. Amen. I'm not going to debate with you. All I know is for me, I'm going to pay my tithe. Because I have seen the fact that I have reaped more than I have sown. So you get, and, but listen, because I also hear a lot of people saying thing, you know, saying all kinds of other things. He says, if you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to the spirit, you shall love the spirit. When you live and walk after the spirit, you will reap everlasting life. Verse nine is so important. He said, let us not be weary and well doing for in due season, Listen, there come some times when we have to go through some things. We suffer financial hardships. We suffer emotional pain. We suffer death. We suffer these things. But he said, if you won't be weary, if you won't give up, if you hang in there and don't give up, you will reap in due season. See, the farmer can't go out there and expect to reap, number one, if he hasn't sown. He can't go out there and expect to reap if it's not the season. He knows that there's a season for reaping. And so it's the same thing for us. If we refuse to give up, don't get tired, don't give up, then we too will reap in due season if we don't faint. All right? All right, you said it. <laughs> you, you gave us your message for the day. <laughs> Let All me right. say this because it's time for us to cut off. We'll be on the time. Uh, I do want to remind you again uh, that Wednesday night, Sue General will be here for part two. A lot of people listen. We had people all over the jurisdiction, across the country that were listening. And, and, and a lot of people said we need to have a part two. So he's going to be with us on uh, Wednesday. Yeah. Starting this evening at 530, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. We're going to have our prayer revival. Prayer revival is just, is just what it says, where the saints will come and we're going to get on our knees. Of course, if you can't get on your knees, you can sit there in the pew, but we're going to cry out to the Lord. Yes. So it's, it, the, the length of service is not like a revival. It's not as long, but the purpose is prayer. And if we want things to change in this land Amen. and in our homes and in this community, somebody has got to petition God. Somebody's Amen. going to have to cry out to God. And I encourage you to come and be a part of the prayer revival uh, these three nights. And then Wednesday night, we will meet with Superintendent Riley. May the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. Look to see you at 1030. Come on. Don't you dare stay at that house. But come on to the house of the Lord and be blessed. Oh, many of y'all didn't know because we didn't really make the announcement. We're going to have a short black history program today. It, it, it's not going to be long. But we do want to recognize as others are doing in the Black History Month. God bless you. God bless you.